I'm Randall here in Texas. And I'm Matt here in Michigan. Today, Randall and I are doing a call-up episode. It's where Randall and I discuss a specific topic and not necessarily a certain movie or TV show. We take an idea and we expand on it and give, uh, give you guys our thoughts on that topic. And today's topic is sequels. So, Randall, what do you think is the main component of a good sequel? So, there's lots of things that make sequels either good or bad, but for me, the biggest thing about a a good sequel is that it has to take the story in a different direction. It has to do something with it. It has to flip the script. It has to be a little bit unexpected. The best sequels do something new and exciting while expanding on the original premise. Uh, Terminator 2 is not like Terminator. You know, you you go in thinking, oh, there's just another human that's going to be protecting Sarah Connor. And it's like, no, the bad guy from the first one is the good guy now. And like Aliens completely even changes the genre. What was a space horror movie is now really a, a space action movie. You know, makes it different than the original. Don't just give the audience the same thing again. That, I think, is the the core of what makes a really good sequel to me. I, I'm curious about your thoughts on the topic, though. Yeah, uh, Your first thought is my exact same thought, and I think it's funny that you actually used the same two movies that I was going to use, too. Two <laughs> that I actually think are some of the best sequels. James Cameron! Two. Yes, and yet I think that's part of it, too, is James Cameron. One thing about sequels, too, it really depends on a lot of different factors, too. Like, how soon does the sequel come after, like, the original movie? Like, what's the main purpose of it? I mean, movies, they're, you know, a lot. some actors want to just get, like, their vision out. Sequels, a lot of times, it's because something worked before, and they want to capitalize on that again. They want to make more money and do it. So, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Bring something new. That's what makes a good sequel. But in this, you have to keep a little bit with like the original two because that's the thing too. A lot of people get alienated if it's like too different before. Like one example I would kind of give is like a, a New Hope for Star Wars when it came out, and when Empire Strikes Back came out, it was different from A New Hope. And initially, there was a little bit of backlash against that, even though a lot of people look at Empire as the best film of the Skywalker saga of, of all of Star Wars but at first there's a little backlash it took that different approach but at the same time too it felt so different from the first movie it didn't have that kind heartedness everyone was kind of like this movie is too dark kind of thing so I think yes I agree with you definitely that's number one it's got to bring something new but at the same time too it, it really depends on like how soon and what your goal is is it a second movie in a larger franchise. One of the things about like Aliens in particular, you have to remember, so Alien comes out in 1979 and it's it's a classic, it's a hit, and it does really well, but like there's not a sequel until 1986. It took a lot of time, it took a lot of thought. The original concept for it was like didn't have Ridley in it at all. It was supposed to be completely new, and James Cameron comes in and he goes, "No, we have to have this character. We have to have this connection." back to the original you can't just make a sequel that's just nothing you know that that has nothing to do with it other than oh here's the scary scary alien you know so do something new but you do have to have those threads that connect it to it but really for me uh, if i go into that microcosm of making something different it's that the characters that you're exploring the characters from your original they have to have some place to go there has to be something to do one of the more modern examples of something that just doesn't work for me is I really liked what they did with Pacific Rim and I see where there's some potential for a sequel because like, you know, these aliens are probably going to try again to, to colonize earth. But the way that sequel ended up happening was you didn't care about your previous characters that much and you took them in weird directions and you had very little, you know, going back to the original movie, it didn't have it. You were just trying to recapture the begin, you know, the the original Pacific Rim instead of making your own movie with just good characters. You have to really care about your characters, and you have to care what they do in order to make a very good sequel. 
I agree. Going back to Empire Strikes Back, I mean, Luke, our main character from A New Hope, he has that change. That's why that big Darth Vader's your father reveal is is, is so impactful. Is I'm because it father. changes the I'm character. Your I'm yep. your father. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the gangster rap. I'm your father. I'm your father. I'm your father. An- another one, too. I mean, this is kind of like a longer sequel and thing is Logan with the X-Men series. Logan basically takes that that Wolverine character and stuff where a lot of it is about him, you know, finding himself and like helping other people. And this it's kind of like he's he can no longer rely on the stuff that he did before him being young and his healing and everything. He doesn't really have that in Logan. And so it, it's kind of like a transformation of that character. And that's what makes it such a good film. Logan, the same thing they did with Professor X, where it's like, he is not, and he he cannot do what he used to do. He is now an old man. He's actually kind of dangerous to keep alive. It's alluded to that he killed most of the X-Men on accident, honestly, in, in Logan. So, yes, they took that character, they flipped the script on them. They're not the strong and powerful characters that they once were. And, okay, now we can tell a story off of that and see where we go, see what happens. Um, so it's it's rare that something like the MCU happens, where it's so planned out. I think that some of the best sequels aren't planned out. Some of them are just like, all right, these are just ideas that people have in their in their minds for how a sequel might happen or how this how this could happen, and that it it goes against the grain where you're like, well, no, sequels have to be so well planned out. Like, not really. All it takes is a really good idea to expand on the original concept of a, of a film. And I think that the, the Star Wars sequel series, the, the, the most recent three, are a good example. Like, you know, no planning at all wasn't necessarily good, but too much planning, like, oh, we're going to have these, is not necessarily good either. I think Ryan Johnson tried to follow a lot of that of, you know, what makes a good sequel when trying to make The Last Jedi. A lot of times it's, you know, Star Wars has been about lineage and that's been like the whole thing, like the Skywalker lineage. And I, you know, The Force Awakens kind of build up on that. It's making Rey's parentage such like a big thing, like a mystery kind of thing. And Ryan Johnson kind of like changed that. It's like, all right. We're going to change this. We're going to say, you know, your parentage doesn't really matter kind of thing. It would have been interesting to see where that could have been taken. But I think that's a good point you put at is having that idea. I think Ryan Johnson had a good idea for a second film. But the reason it didn't work is because I don't think the idea for like the third film, it I, it it was a maybe a good sequel if it was like ending there, but the fact that it's going on to a third film, that that third film, that other sequel didn't really build on what was established in that second movie. I do want to talk a little bit about like the the juggernaut that is the MCU, because it, it's kind of a different it's a different beast as far as sequels are concerned. You look at it and there's like an order to watch everything. You know, Iron Man 1, Iron Man 2, and then Thor happens about the same time as Iron Man, Captain America happens, and you know, like, like there's an order to it, and each little movie is kind of a sequel to another MCU movie in some way, as well as a sequel to, like, Thor and Thor Ragnarok. This doesn't sound right. Well, it's true. It's rare. That's why everyone says, oh, we're trying to replicate what the MCU does. I'm like, it's so hard to do what they did. I think one of the reasons it works from a sequel perspective is that if you look at the sequels, they're all so different from their original concept. Like Guardians of the Galaxy and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, they have the same cast, but they have completely different stakes and completely different concepts that they throw the characters into. And that's why it works, you know, like. Iron Man 1, he's on top of the world. He's just this big hero. Iron Man 2 comes and he's, you know, brought down to Earth. Iron Man 3 comes and he's he's just put by himself away. You know, no help. The sequels there work because they follow a lot of the key things that we've already discussed. Expand upon it, flip the script, make things that are different, while at the same time staying true to your characterization. 
And then each movie inside the MCU also gets an opportunity to ex- explore a different genre. Well, it's interesting too. I mean, and they don't all work. I mean, talking about the MCU, there's movies in here, sequels that don't work. I mean, talk about, you know, uh, Thor, was it the dark below or whatever? That movie doesn't really work. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. One of my favorite sequels that I have on my list of some of my favorite uh, sequels is Thor Ragnarok because how that is kind of like that change. We get that thing where we completely change Thor and we change the tone. Instead of being kind of more of like a dark and brooding one, we get more of a lighthearted, colorful. There's a lot of color in Thor Ragnarok. And I think that's kind of with the direction with like Taika Waititi and stuff with that took with that film and stuff. Yeah, it, it's it, it's an interesting thing, but see like Thor Thor the Dark World is a an interesting idea of where they they didn't change very much they didn't change the character and they didn't expand the character thor has no growth in in the dark world he's just he's just got a script and he's following the script you know uh, his character doesn't doesn't get any better i guess from that perspective and really the only thing in there that's worth watching is the interaction between him and loki cuz that is just two pretty good actors just going after each other. That's about the only thing that's enjoyable in that film. Other than that, it is, like you said, it's kind of a, a failed sequel. It just doesn't have doesn't have a lot of the things that we pointed out that we really like in a newer a newer sequel. Um, but the other the other side of the coin is like what makes a bad sequel, or I, I shouldn't even make a bad sequel. Is what like what could make a bad movie? The Amazing Spider Man Two with uh, Andrew Garfield, not part of the MCU. It was so busy with the idea of setting up a sequel that it forgot to make a good movie in the first place. Yeah, I didn't really watch that one, so I can't really talk too much about that. But, you know, staying with Spider-Man, I mean, Spider-Man 3, there was just so much in that film that it's, you know, (laughs) it was a bit of a mess. I think a lot of things, too, that we were talking about, going back on, like, good ones, too, like, part of that you know, changing like your main characters and stuff. A lot of it is putting up a good challenge for them. And you were saying, you know, the, the dark world Thor part of the, the one of the only things that was actually good about that was kind of like the interaction between Thor and Loki. And that's the kind of thing too. You got to have that, that good, you know, Loki is one of the best villain, semi villains in the MCU. And I think that's part of it too. You got to have that good challenge for them. If the challenge doesn't really matter to the character, you know, to their development and stuff, I mean, it it makes for a not so good movie. Yeah, definitely. So that's something that, again, in the MCU, they learned pretty well with, uh, you had the Avengers and it's this global scale problem, you know, we're talking about Earth being invaded from alien, you know, by aliens. You take it back down. You completely change the tone for Avengers: Age of Ultron, and and you put the characters in a different place, and you give them something different that they've never really had to attack before. That they don't really know how to to do it. They're they're finding out that they don't necessarily agree on everything, and they you know they they start seeing some tension there. It's not just this dream team that's been put together. Um, that's part of what makes Age of Ultron what it is a a pretty good film i think when i watched it i was kind of a little disappointed because i wanted more avengers but really in retrospect rewatching age of ultron i i sit there and i think you know what joss whedon he he knew what he was doing with this he he had a concept and he knew how to make a sequel and and I, i i give age of ultron more credit now than i did when i first watched it but um going back to the sam raimi spider mans that you had mentioned so like Spider-Man 2 is is held up high as not only one of the best comic book movies ever but it is a fantastic sequel. It takes our character, it kind of forces some character growth, uh it puts him in a situation that he's never faced before. He doesn't know what to do. He's got to think on his feet. Um that that's in juxtaposition to too much in Spider-Man 3. Yeah. I, I think a lot of these two, you got to kind of look at like sequels as a wider picture to going back with the MCU and other things is, is like, 
is this a movie that's just a sequel? Is it the second movie of like two movies or is this a part of a much larger thing? And I think what can make bad sequels is if films kind of seem like like fillers. I would say one of the downfalls of kind of like Age of Ultron to me when it really just in it you know, feel too great is because that Ultron isn't the big villain. He is of the film, but we already know that the big villain really is Thanos kind of thing. Uh, one thing I would look at is going to Star Wars, kind of like Attack of the Clones. I mean, in the in the first movie, you had Maul as your villain and you just killed him off. And then in the second movie, you kind of have like Dooku, but in your mind, you know that Dooku isn't the real villain of this. You you know it's going to be Emperor. It's kind of thing is like we already knew what the story was going to be for the third movie before it came out. So Attack of the Clones really just kind of feels like a filler movie. And that's why it doesn't really work as like a good sequel, in my opinion. Uh, another another topic for sequels that I, I think are is important for a good sequel is Escalation. Now, this could be escalation within characters, as we've discussed, or just like on the grand scale of things. But I do think it's important that a sequel up the ante from from the original. Now, to what degree is really how, you know, how fine filmmaking works, I guess, you know, like Endgame works because it was built up to. And Infinity War works because it was built up to. Uh, you kept making things bigger and bigger. Now, I, I've always found that the, the movies after that, like uh, Far From Home for Spider-Man, it's a fun movie to watch. It's a kind of a little bit of a letdown from, from watching the big, grandiose Infinity War, you know? Um, so I think that some of the best sequels are, are really good at, at escalating without going overboard they do spider-man 2 without doing spider-man 3 you know empire strikes back is a very good example of it even though you don't have a death star the stakes are more personal so they've escalated the the tension and the danger to the individual characters that you know and love versus just making another big planet killing machine you know aliens does the same thing and escalates the, the craziness like it's all action oriented versus just horror oriented and it's it's got so many more aliens so i think escalation is also something that's really important for a good sequel uh, w one we'll go back to i mean this is my number one sequel and uh, it's terminator 2 and talk about escalation it's the villain itself is escalated like the first one we have a robot that looks like a human that's a killing machine and then two we have you know the t-1000 which you know, liquid metal can do different things that the Terminator couldn't do. And it's kind of interesting, too, going on that one. We actually, you know, change who our main character is. And the first one, we had, like, Sarah Connor. And Sarah Connor is a big part of Terminator 2. And look at, but I would say a lot of it is her son. Like, that's the one they're really protected. I don't know. I guess it's kind of like half and half. It's both John Connor and Sarah Connor. Because at the same time, too, it's, a, you know... Sarah Connor was trying to stay alive to protect her son. And in the second movie, it's her protecting her son after he's been born kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I, I agree too. Up in the Andy, changing the stakes in it, you definitely got to do it. If we kind of lose interest and stuff, if it's the same thing. You already mentioned, like, Star Killer Base. A lot of people kind of put down, you know, The Force Awakens because it is. It's just another Death Star. I mean... Yeah, it's really what we did. It's another planet-killing thing. And that's another thing about, like, Return of the Jedi. Same thing when that came out. That was the same thing. It's It it was another, for at least for, like, the Rebellion, it was another Death Star. But I think what made Return of the Jedi a little bit better is the fact that the stakes really weren't about the Death Star. It was really about, you know, Luke. Luke. Luke stakes. Luke stakes. Whether or not he can turn Darth Vader back, whether... Whether it's it's the personal stakes, not the, the big Death Star. The big Death Star is just there to give other characters something to do. Yep, yep, totally agree. And my my last thing that I really like that, that I think just does really make a very good sequel is it still has to be a good movie. 
It still has to stand on its own. So you don't have to watch Terminator to like and enjoy Terminator 2. It works by itself. You don't have to watch Alien to enjoy Aliens. It works by itself. Honestly, you don't necessarily have to watch Star Wars A New Hope specifically to understand Empire Strikes Back. It tells a good story by itself. It is a good movie. And I think that that's another thing that a lot of filmmakers kind of forget when they're making sequels. They're like, oh, especially today, we're going to make a sequel with the express idea of making another sequel after that. Concentrate on making a good movie first. Yep, I totally agree. Uh, for you guys, Randall and I want to know what are your favorite sequels? Randall and I, a lot of ours are the same. We kind of matched our sequels together, but there's some different ones that we missed. We want to hear about them. We want to know why you think they, what makes them such good sequels stuff. If you like this callback video, uh, be sure to give us a thumbs up. We got ton more on our website. Be sure to subscribe and so you can hear more about this stuff when it comes out. We also have a social media page. We can keep you up to date on stuff that we're working on and the next videos that are coming out. Uh, for now, I'm Matt in Michigan. Have a good day. And I'm Randall here in Texas. Didn't mention Star Trek in this movie. <laughs> Come